Okay, so it's a, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Professor Wei Rahan from University of Illinois at Carbon Campaign, uh, where I um, is an associate professor and also is the chair for the math department at UIC. She got her, her PhD from Brown University in, in Kazan Six, and then uh, under the direction of Professor Walter Strauss. And then she spent three years at MIT as a postdoc before she joined UIC as a faculty. Uh, Rira has get, um, man, uh, have, have obtained many uh, awards, including an uh, NSF career, and, uh, snow panel, assignment panel, to name a few. So her researching area are uh, mainly in modeling, the analysis, and computation of water wave problems. And then she will be talking about the breaking, peaking, and the disintegration related to the water wave. Uh, thanks for the uh, quite an introduction. All right. Uh, and thanks for coming through the snow. I make this uh, as gentle as uh, possible, as uh, this is the first uh, colloquium of the semester I heard. The motion of the fluid can be very complicated, as we know whenever we see waves break on a beach or fly in an airplane. In the 18th century, Euler proposed the very first comprehensive mathematical model for an incompressible fluid, which I recorded. Um, this is not working. Uh, in this box here, the first set of equations, they uh, describe how the velocity u of a fluid at a position x and time p should move under the influence of the pressure and possibly an outside force. And the second equation means that the volume of the fluid does not change in motion. There are many variants of uh, this Euler's model. Perhaps the most famous one is uh, proposed by Navier and Stokes, which allows the fluid to be viscous. The Euler equations, they, as you see, are very concise, yet, they capture the essence of fluid behaviors in an idealized fashion. And they have provided source and inspiration for many branches of mathematics. For example, it was uh, the main motivation for Cauchy to develop his uh, complex function theory. Uh, of course, uh, an immense amount of uh, progress has been uh, made uh, over uh, almost uh, three centuries. But uh, difficulties of understanding fluid is uh, so profound that uh, there are huge problems still beyond our reach. A famous one is one of these clay's uh, millennium problems, which uh, asks uh, if, uh, there are, uh, if a solution to the uh, navier Stokes equation in two space dimensions will exist for all time or not. Waves, jets, and drops, they come to mind when we think of fluids. These objects, they have the common feature that uh, one or two fluids are separated by an interface, which is a priori unknown and has to be determined as part of the solution. In the PD community, they go by the name of uh, free boundary problems. Three boundaries are mathematically challenging in their own rights, and they appear in many different situations. For example, melting of ice, in which case the boundary of the ice is free, or when you stretch a flexible membrane, like a rubber band, over an obstacle, in which case the, the, the boundary of the contact region is free. Water waves. Uh, refer to the situation where water lies uh, below a body of air and the whole motion is acted on by gravity. Now, in the bulk of the fluid, we use uh, the Euler's uh, equation for an incompressible fluid to describe its motion, and here G denotes you know, uh, the gravity constant. Now, in this problem, the interface between the water and air is free and it requires two boundary conditions because one, because it is a boundary value problem of a PDE and that the other, because it is an unknown, it requires an equation to describe its motion. Now, the first equation in blue 
it uh, expresses the fact that fluid particles cannot invade the air, nor vice versa. And the second equation, as it reads, uh, it says that uh, the pressure at the fluid surface equals the atmospheric pressure, which is constant if we ignore the effects of surface tension and other effects. Now, in the infinite depth, it is reasonable to require that there is practically no motion at the great depth. And in the finite depth case, instead, we will require that the flow at the bottom is tangential to the bottom topography. And these equations in the box, they make the water wave problem in the simplest possible form. Yes. Yes, the U is the velocity vector yeah. and uh, eta and uh, so U is uh, either in R2 or R3 depending on the, the problem, the demand on the problem. And uh, eta is the, the surface, so it's the one mass dimension. And uh, this uh, gradient eta minus one is uh, pointing in the normal direction to, to the surface. Uh, so that uh, yes, yeah, so that the fluid particles at the fluid surface at the fluid surface must move along the fluid surface uh, because it cannot jump or like it cannot sink. Uh, it's coming up. All right. Uh, water waves are a prime example of applied mathematics. Uh, it's supposed to describe what we may see or feel at the beach or in a boat. And uh, th they include uh, a variety of wave phenomena, ranging from the tiny depots driven by surface tension to large scale events like the tsunamis or low waves. Uh, and they have impacts outside of mathematics uh, from hydraulics to weather prediction. Uh, this is a hard problem. And, and a part of the difficulty uh, dealing with the water wave problem is because it is a free bounded problem. Now, in some special situations, for example, if the vorticity of the fluid is zero, and which can be justified in some situations, then we can rewrite the governing equation to water wave problem that I showed in some slides ago entirely in terms of the quantities that are only defined at the fluid surface so that we can get rid of this free boundary feature. And of course, that this comes at a price and the result becomes necessarily non-local. What that means is uh, in equations, uh, you see differentiation and uh, integration together. What that implies in this is, in order to understand what's happening at a point at the fluid surface, we have to know what's happening everywhere else. To make things worse, these boundary conditions at the fluid surface, they are non-linear. And uh, Feynman, uh, in his lecture notes on physics, uh, wrote that, uh, water waves are the worst possible example because they have all the complications that waves can have. The Cauchy problem is to solve the governing equations for the water wave problem for an arbitrary initial conditions. To be precise, that the shape of the initial, the shape of the fluid surface and the, the velocity distribution. <coughs> well, poseness means that a solution to this uh, Cauchy problem exists and it's unique and the solution depends on the initial condition continuously and of course it all is in some appropriate function space. It was not until 20 years ago that Zhe Wu proved the short time well poseness for an arbitrary size of initial data in a public space. And I have to say that all the earlier work than her work assumed smallness of the solution. So this was the first result that removes the size condition about the solution. Anyway, she proved the, the short time well poseness of this problem as long as 
this condition in the box was true. And roughly speaking, this condition says that the pressure is decreasing as we exit the water region. And this seems reasonable because we certainly feel more pressure as we dive into the water. But the, what the seems totally, what is uh, totally non-trivial in her work, in my opinion, is that this so-called Taylor sign condition holds true if and only if the fluid surface does not intersect itself. In particular, this condition implies that the, the fluid surface does not intersect itself and vice versa. These two conditions, uh, they are equivalent. It doesn't have to be graph. And uh, so you, we are not, so like a, to make things simpler, when I described the waterway problem, I assumed, and I didn't make this explicit, uh, the fluid surfaces of the graph form, but uh, you will have to require that. And in particular, it's the consequence of her proof that even overhanging waves, they persist uh, at least for a short time if uh, the, all the data is smooth enough. And this is why we can surf on a thick wave like this. Well, I'm not a surfer, but uh, um, well, if there is a surfer in this room, can you verify? <laughs> All right. Since the Wu's work, there has been an explosion of thesis activities concerning short time well proofness in the problem with increasing complexity. So now the theory can handle uh, the effect of vorticity, compressibility, surface tension, even angle cast, and like uh, this wave uh, in the photo. And those who were in the lunchtime upstairs, and this is the photo that uh, I was uh, talking about. Uh, also, there has recently, there has been an impressive progress about long time or all time behavior of uh, the solution, assuming that the initial condition is sufficiently small and localized. And uh, the, there is a list of uh, some uh, contributions in this direction. Yes, uh, if it is not global in time, then uh, there is a result about almost global. That means that if the initial data is size absolute in some certain space norm, then the, the existence time is uh, ex exponential to the one of epsilon. Yes. Uh, now, these are all very hard proofs, uh, but there is some common theme running through these works. The key ingredients of the proofs are dispersed estimates for the linear part of the problem and a very detailed analysis of the nonlinearity of the problem, and that is typically performed by normal form transformation. And then the nonlinear estimate of the whole problem. And I will say a few words about uh, dispersion effect. Dispersion means that waves with different frequencies propagate at the different velocities. Water waves are dispersive, and this is a fact you can easily experiment. Now, if you throw a little stone into a quiet lake or a bathtub with a water filled in, then you will see rings of waves propagate out, like in this photo. And rings of different radii, therefore, different uh, period and different frequencies, they travel with different velocities. So that these waves get sorted out by their frequencies. And this is dispersion. And more precisely, the speed, phase speed of uh, wave number k is given by this formula in the box. And here g is again the gravity constant and h is the water depth. Now, for relatively shallow water, 
therefore relatively low weight so that this k times h small then in such a shallow water limit this phase speed approaches the limiting value square root of g h and um, uh, here's some interesting history it was uh, 1815 that the French Academy of Science had uh, some math problem contest. And I guess that this is somewhat similar to this millennium problems that we have these days. That year, the problem was uh, to explain or solve the water weight problem. So I guess that the water weight problem is a hot topic for a long time. Um, young Koshi, at the age of 25, he won the competition, and that was the beginning of math career. Now, on the right, now this scan is not showing that well, but this is the first page of his prize-winning article. Koshi was a prolific writer, and uh, the complete work of Koshi spans out 16 big books. And you can find this article in volume one, page one of his complete work of Koshi. Now, this is a long article, 120 pages long. And in these many pages, Koshi used what we now call the Fourier transform to starting from the water weight problem to derive the wave equation. This is my interpretation. But anyways, so with the speed that matches with the shallow limit. All right, so uh, take home message so far is, well, people have been successful describing long time dynamics or all time dynamics using the PDE techniques of some water weights. But it is a matter of experience that uh, ocean waves after some time typically be uh, develop some vertical part and then this vertical part overturns and sprays a jet of water. And so think of uh, this famous uh, artistic representation. Willem, in his famous book on linear and nonlinear waves, said that the breaking phenomenon is one of the most <coughs> intriguing long standing problems of water wave theory. The water weight problem is very complicated and it is uh, difficult to solve even numerically. So he was interested in finding simpler model that can capture this breaking effect. So to begin, the shallow water equation that is the, the top of the slide, uh, it is, uh, they are a sim simpler approximate uh, model of water waves and they explain wave breaking. That means a solution remains bounded, but its slope becomes unbounded. This is not a hard fact to see because if you realize the, the system in the characteristic variable, then you end up with two invisible Burgers equation. And it's a well-known fact that the invisible Burgers equation develops the shock in finite time. In fact, here, wave breaking is simply a fancy word of shock. But the shallow water theory goes too far. It predicts that all non-trivial solutions break, but uh, some water waves do not break. For example, solitary water waves. This is happening maybe because the shallow water equations ignore dispersive effects of water waves. Now, in the shallow water regime, where k times h is small, you can tailor expand the phase velocity of the water wave problem, and the leading order term, square root of gh, which does not depend on the spatial, uh, spatial frequency, is uh, the dispersion relation of the shallow water equation. So in this model, all wave components, they travel at the same speed, and this is not what's happening in water waves. If so, a natural way to proceed seems that uh, to add some dispersive effects to better approximate uh, this uh, dispersive behavior, 
So now, if I use the first two terms on the right hand side in the tail expansion to approximate the dispersion relation of the water weight problem, then these two terms, they make precisely the dispersion relation of the famous quarterback debris equation. And the KDB equation is another shallow water model. And, uh, but the KDB theory goes too far again. Now, no solutions break. And this is happening maybe because the KDB dispersion is uh, too good to be true. Well, for shallow water, long waves, when k times h is small, then the KDB dispersion will approximate the water wave dispersion. But uh, when k times h becomes large, then the KDB dispersion behaves completely differently from the water wave dispersion. We then, then proposed to, to take the full dispersion of the water wave problem, no approximation, by taking the phase speed of the water wave problem and to turn that into a non-local operator and combine that with a shallow water nonlinearity to arrive at this equation in this box. And then he conjectured that uh, this model will have a wave breaking. And um, about 50 years later, recently, I proved this conjecture. Uh, the proof is quite complicated, but the idea is very simple. Uh, the apparent difficulty of handling this modem equation is this uh, ugly looking non local dispersion operator. If we ignore this for a moment, then we simply have this Burgers equation, which we all know will develop a breaking. More precisely, the Burgers equation will make a breaking in a time that is inversely proportional to the maximum slope of the initial condition. I get there. I will get there. So first, let me explain how, what is the idea of the proof. It is, so I, what I proved is that there is a wave breaking provided at this condition. This is not conjecture, this is the theorem that I proved. Okay, all right. His conjecture is, uh, well, not written in a precise form, but uh, remember that he criticized the, the shallow water equation because uh, yeah, it of some water waves. Rain, rain. No, he, because uh, in water waves, uh, some waves break and some waves don't break. So he wanted to have uh, some model that uh, will feature that uh, some waves break and some waves don't break. <laughs> All right, and uh, obviously the shallow water equations uh, fail the task. Okay, uh, so where was I? Now, so the, for the Burgers equation only, the solution will break down in a time that is proportional, inversely proportional to the maximum of the slope of initial condition. So the idea is if I prepare my initial condition having large slope, then the Burgers part will try to break this in a very short time. And maybe this time is so short that this weak dispersion cannot uh, undo the breaking. And uh, of course, it's a lot of work to turn this idea into a rigorous proof, but uh, because of this reason, to some extent, uh, this proof, uh, breaking proof, requires this condition that uh, the initial, condition, initial slope uh, is sufficiently large at some point. And on the other hand, 
uh, the, the precise statement of uh, the theorem is very complicated. This is one of the conditions, and there are other conditions, but uh, this is the most uh, crucial condition. Yes, uh, <laughs> in front of one, uh, uh, let me try to think. Uh, I write it down and I will show you my actual paper after my talk. It will that be okay or? <laughs> okay. But, uh, uh, there is a no app. So there is a large quantity which is inversely proportional to some small quantity epsilon that comes from the, the, the corner that you represent uh, this uh, uh, non-local dispersed operator in an integral form. And uh, uh, I will show you all the details. Uh, okay. Um, okay, now, so if you have uh, a large slope in your initial condition, then that, that will lead to breaking in finite time. The other thing is if your initial data has no this uh, high frequency components, so if it is all made up of the low frequencies, then the solution will exist uh, for a longer time than is expected breaking time, which uh, again depends on the small quantity. And in particular, the Wooden equation supports uh, solitary waves, uh, which are made up of low frequency data only and which do not break. Now, uh, the proof, the breaking proof here. This is useful for other related equations. And to illustrate, I take what we call the fractional KDB equation here in the box, which it is uh, take the Willem equation and replace the Willem dispersion relation by a fractional Laplacian. Now, when alpha is two, then this equation becomes the KDB equation. And when alpha is one, then it is uh, the benjamin owner equation. When alpha is zero, it's the Burgers equation. And uh, lastly, when alpha is negative one, this is called the Burgers Hilbert equation. And it has uh, also some relevance to the water wave problem. Now, when alpha is between negative one and negative one third, then this equation develops uh, wave breaking. And the proof uh, follows the same argument as uh, in the uh, Wilhelm equation. But when alpha is zero, the Burgers equation has the wave breaking. So it is not true to expect, to have, expect the wave breaking in the full range uh, between negative one to zero. Sadly, my proof ceased to work beyond uh, this uh, value, negative one third 
so this is still an open problem. When alpha is negative one for the Burgers Hilbert equation, there are some supporting arguments, the supporting evidence for four wave breaking. There's a Spanish group uh, who proved that the gradient blow up, but the derivative blows up in finite time. And uh, the Penn State group, uh, they treated uh, this equation just like the uh, hyperbolic conservation law, and they worked out a uh, weak entropy solution, which is bounded for all time. But the uniqueness and other issues are all open. Now, uh, one possible approach towards the, the breaking conjecture. Some years ago, I was able to prove a gradient blow up uh, for this equation in the range of a negative one to zero. And the proof, of, uh, I mimicked the idea, the, the breaking argument for the parabolic argument, uh, which is not showing very clearly. But anyways, for parabolic analog equation, they enjoy the maximum principle, so the gradient blow up implies wave breaking. So if one can manage it to establish a priori bound for the solution to the FKDB in this range, then you have a winner. Now, in the interest of time, uh, the ill poisonous uh, issue of the waterway problem is poorly understood. Uh, and this is uh, one important aspect uh, that we need to put more effort on to understand now what the possible way of uh, hypothesis can happen in this related equation. Now for any alpha, the map that takes the initial condition to the solution to the FKDB is not uniformly continuous in a sublet space in the periodic setting for any positive sublet exponent. Uh, this is an easy fact. The proof is, for, to, to, for the proof, take the initial condition cosine of a high frequency n and solve the linear part of the equation that adds uh, this uh, n to the alpha plus one p factor. And now this equation enjoys the Galilean invariant so that you can shift to the solution up and down by, trans by like, in putting this uh, in the appropriate traveling frame. And then now the, the difference of these two linear approximate solutions will grow like order of p. This idea was first implemented by Koch and Spetkov for the benjamin Euler equation, but in the non-periodic setting. And then this idea was used by many other people. In particular, uh, Simonas and Michelek, uh, they handled the, the incomplete Euler equation, and Barbara and uh, her collaborators uh, recently developed uh, this idea for the incompressible uh, Euler equations. But uh, for FKDV, this for this equation in the periodic setting, the average of the solution is a conserved quantity so that uh, uh, the equation is invariant in the space of mean zero functions. And uh, in the mean zero functions, you cannot play this game of shifting the solution up and down. Moreover, this argument only uses the linear part of the equation. It cares nothing about the what the nonlinearity is. So are there any other uh, ill posing scenario that is driven by nonlinear clouds. And recently, we able to show norm inflation for the FKDB equation in a sublet space uh, of uh, mean zero function for sufficiently negative sublet exponent. For the proof, now I'm going to take the initial condition that is uh, supported in two high frequency, at adjacent high frequency. And then through this quadratic interactions, these two high frequencies will produce the low frequency component, which if you measure in a negative sublet space becomes large. And this idea was general enough. And I actually took this idea from a work of a Christ Coriander Tau. And a little later, Rougain 
and uh, Natasha Pavlovich, they really popularized this for the Navier Stokes equation and the other related equations. Now, I will turn the attention to periodic waves, periodic water waves that uh, travels a long distance at a practically constant velocity without changing form. So think of waves uh, in this uh, famous photograph of the water wave problem. In the 19th century, as in the Navier Stokes equation, he made uh, many contributions about waves of this form. Uh, for example, he observed that the crest becomes sharper and troughs uh, become flatter as the amplitude increases. And uh, he also observed that the wave of cost greatest possible height will have a sharp corner at the wave crest with the contained angle of 120 degrees. Nearly 100 years later, Amy Frankel and Toland, and independently Plotnikov, they proved that such a corner wave exists. But it is still an open problem if this corner wave is the wave of greatest height. Now, this problem is really, really old, and uh, uh, it is impossible to do justice to all the contributions that have been made to this problem. But uh, I want to say, and I have to say that in an irrotational flow, that means with zero vorticity, and in the infinite depths, then some recent advances were based on the formulation, reformulation of the problem, and there's no approximation. The full problem to a very concise non-linear non-local equation that in this box, which is due to, originally due to Babenko. But vorticity is important in fluid mechanics, regardless with or without the resources. And in fact, even in the simplest case of constant vorticity and for small amplitude, you can analytically describe the flow underneath of Stokes wave will ha can have a layer of a singular, sing in layer of a singular points, uh, and this is uh, not possible for zero vorticity. And a recent uh, and ongoing project, uh, uh, my postdoc Sergei uh, Diatenko and I took the conformal mapping techniques to derive or to generalize Babenko's equation for the zero vorticity and infinite depth case to allow constant, non-zero constant vorticity and uh, possibly a finite depth. And the result is here in the box. Here, uh, the split T is a fully multiply operator and the multiply is minus i times hyperbolic tangent and the, this d is related to, in some sense, the water depth. And now uh, this omega is the constant vorticity and if you drop this vorticity term and if you send this depth to infinite, then this equation becomes the original Popenko equation. And uh, we solved this equation numerically, but before we move on, this uh, conform mapping techniques, uh, they go back to Stokes itself. And many people use uh, these techniques. And I want to particularly mention uh, this uh, very nice contribution by Sela Tanvir uh, in the 1990s. Now, we, saw, we make uh, some new findings in this problems, which uh, I'm going to share. So first thing first, uh, to sim for simplicity, I take the infinite depth. Uh, and uh, the reason is here, as you see, the depth only enters in this game through this uh, multiplying factor, right? So, and in fact, uh, we observe numerically that uh, the depth does not make any new phenomenon. It does not make any qualitative changes of the solution. 
on the other hand, the volatility introduces new nonlinearities so that uh, it uh, makes a new phenomena. So uh, in these uh, reserves, uh, the depth is always infinite. Now, for each fixed volatility omega, we collect the solutions in this plane that uh, wave speed c versus some amplitude, and we use the stiffness, which measures the difference between the crust trough divided by the period, so that uh, this is non-dimensionalized uh, quantity. Now, it is uh, well accepted, even in the 70s, that when the volatility is zero, then the amplitude monotonically increases towards this corner wave, while the wave speed that they oscillate infinitely many times. This uh, has been reproduced by many people. But then, as we increase the volatility, then we see that uh, this amplitude is not monotone anymore, and it makes a fold. It increases and decreases. And the, the fold increases in size, with volatility. Moreover, what's happened to the solution, by the way, each point here represents a solution, a wave. On the left side of the fold, along the left side of the fold, the wave becomes more and more rounded, and on the right side, it's less and less. <laughs> Putting all together, for sufficiently large volatility, for example, for volatility omega 2, then this is a lifespan of the solution curve. We start out with the small and the non-overhanging wave, for example, wave A. And then as we move along the solution curve, the, solution, the, the wave becomes rounded and rounded. And then it becomes overhanging at some point, And uh, it touches at the trough line. The, it's the, the profile itself and trapping an air bubble. And we call this touching wave. And as we further continue along the curve, now the solution, the, now the fluid region overlaps with the neighboring fluid region, and this solution becomes unphysical. And, but nevertheless, uh, these solutions grow until the peak, all the way to the peak of the, the board. And then on the other side of the fold, now the solution becomes less rounded and rounded. And so that at some point, uh, it uh, becomes a touching wave again. That's a wave E. And beyond this point, uh, the solution becomes physical again. And eventually, the solution ends up in a corner wave. So that uh, for large enough volatility, the part of the, the fold becomes uh, it's represented by physical solutions, and we call this a gap. And this gap is limited by two touching waves, B and wave B and wave B. And I want to say that uh, some uh, all the earlier works before us, uh, the, their numerical method diverges on the gap. So that uh, these people, they uh, somehow, they assume that uh, the solution curve will eventually end at the corner wave and directly approximates the corner wave, the end of the curve, and then work backwards to find the, the sorry. Uh, and work backwards to find uh, this touching wave E. Okay. Uh, but uh, this uh, is not okay because if we increase the voltage even more strong, even stronger way, then we find more gaps and more folds and more gaps. Go to the previous one. Second law. Yes, so these panels, they show the, the wave, each as uh, the Stokes wave. So this curve is the free boundary. These blue curves are free boundaries. Okay. 
No. Uh, and here, I should have said, but uh, we're using Babenko type equation. And so if we solve this equation for y, and then once we get a solution, then we can reconstruct the, the parametric curve of free surface using this parametric equation. All right. Now, so for example, when vorticity is 2.5, then this is the life, life, uh, life cycle of the solution curve. So on the first fold and the first gap, the same thing happens as previous case. And then there is a second fold and the second gap. Along that, uh, we have roughly two overhangings. It becomes touching wave and then the unphysical solutions and then touching wave again. But uh, ultimately, the solution curve ends up again at the corner wave. Yes. And uh, a, moreover, now, so for sufficiently large vorticity, we always have a, a first gap. And if we trace uh, these uh, endpoints of the gap, so the touching waves, uh, as we increase the vorticity, and as we increase at the beginning of the gap, the waves uh, approaches the limiting proper wave, which is an exact solution of uh, the capillary wave problem. And on the end point of the gap, the solution approaches as the voltage increases, the fluid around the fluid disk in with body rotation. And this also solves the, the motorway problem with surface tension only, so the zero gravity. So at the large voltage limit, there is a surprising link between the vorticity, constant vorticity, and surface tension, which is still a mystery to us. Uh, to summarize, a, one possible way to explain what's going on here is, now for zero vorticity, we all know that the wave speed has infinitely many oscillations. And uh, we think that as we increase the vorticity, then this first oscillation wakes up and becomes fourth and then becomes gap. As we increase the vorticity even more, then the, the second, fourth, sec second oscillation wakes up and becomes fourth and gap and more. So for example, when the vorticity is four, then we have five gaps. Moreover, if we compute the solutions at the end points uh, of uh, these gaps, then it's the crapper wave and the disc, and then disc on top of crapper, and disc on top of disc, and so on. All right, I think I have uh, 10 minutes for the last item. So, <laughs> Benjamin said that Stokes waves are theoretically possible at the state of uh, dynamic equilibrium. This is uh, an applied math way of saying that the, solution, the Stokes waves exist mathematically. But uh, in the 1960s, Brooke Benjamin had trouble producing the Stokes waves in the laboratory setting and he came to believe that these waves, while they exist mathematically, theoretically, they might be unstable, which is uh, why it is hard to observe them in, in practice. Uh, Benjamin's experiments are found in many places, for example, in this famous book by Van Dyck, but uh, these photos I took from his, one of his papers. Uh, so in his experiments, he designed a long wave tank and generated Stokes wave pattern that uh, is uh, on the left panel. And then he perturbed the Stokes wave so that the period of this periodic wave will change slightly. And then after a long time, this uh, perturbed wave uh, evolved. He found the photo on the right, 
and it was safer for him to say that these waves got disintegrated. And that was uh, the word that he used in his uh, paper. Shortly after his experiments, Benjamin and Fear, they offered a theoretical explanation of their experimental finding. And about the same time, Widom got the same conclusion that this wave is unstable with respect to this periodic changing perturbations if the wave number of the original unperturbed uh, wave times the water depth is greater than a critical number approximately 1.36 degree. And this phenomenon is goes by the name of benzene fear or more generally modulational and stability. And similar results arrived uh, about almost the same time, but completely independently by people all over the world, like uh, Benny, Newell, Karoff, uh, Ostrovsky, and many others. And uh, the Karoff later wrote a, a, an expository article about this early history of um, uh, modulational instability. And to quote him, the idea was emerging when the time was right. In the 1990s, Bridges and Milke, they vigorously proved the benzene fear instability for the water wave problem, but in the finite depth case, and their proof breaks down in the infinite depth case. Moreover, this proof leaves some important issues open. For example, this uh, cannot uh, say anything about the uh, instability of, uh, that is caused by collision of uh, eigenvalues away from the origin in the spectral plane and many others. Uh, and um, the overall, the benzene fear instability is not well understood uh, mathematically or analytically. So to find some framework to understand this phenomenon a little better, uh, what I did together with Matt Johnson is again, take the Willem equation. And uh, our idea is, well, so if you look at this Benzene fear instability criterion, this is about K times H, right? So that uh, this suggests that this benzene fear instability is a high frequency phenomenon. It will not be captured in low frequency or like a shallow model. So we want to work with the, some model that uh, has the high frequency part of the water wave problem and the Willem equation was uh, one of the uh, candidates. So we took the Willem equation and in the interest of time, let me get to the conclusion. So we proved that a small amplitude periodic traveling wave solution to the Willem equation is modulationally unstable if this index is negative and this index is made up of uh, the dispersion relation of the water wave problem, the phase speed of the water wave problem, which involves square root and hyperbolic tangent. But you can evaluate numerically explicitly this formula, and it turns out that uh, this index formula changes sign from positive to negative at around uh, 1.145. So, or small amplitude, the period traveling wave of the Widom equation is modulationally unstable if uh, its normalized uh, wave number is uh, bigger than this critical number. And now, uh, if you compare this result against the original former in the fear instability criterion, and least qualitatively, the Widom equation seems to predict this uh, instability phenomenon. But of course, uh, we already know that Bridges and Nick proved this uh, for the full water wave problem, and the Willem equation is only a model equation. So we will not, we don't discover any new phenomenon here. But instead, what we offer here 
is a more detailed understanding of the instability mechanism. So through this analysis, we discover the index formula, which has four different terms. And the modulational instability or stability will change each and every time one of these factors changes its sign. And uh, many of these uh, in terms have uh, physical interpretations. So the first one on top, uh, I1, uh, and before that, uh, the bookkeeping thing. So C itself is a phase speed, and the derivative of K times C of K is a group speed. So with that, the first term on top, it becomes zero, so that it uh, signals the change of uh, modulation instability, instability if the group speed, uh, if the, the wave number is a critical point of the group speed. And uh, the second term on top becomes zero if the group velocity equals the phase velocity at the low wave limit. And the bottom factor becomes zero if the phase speed of the fundamental harmonic equals the phase speed of the second harmonic. And when this happens in the water wave context, uh, this uh, gives uh, the Wilton report. And these three factors, uh, we call them linear effects because uh, they, we can determine these just by calculating, just by looking at the, the linear part, the dispersible part of the equation it requires no calculations whatsoever. And unlikely these three, the last factor, this uh, is uh, some combination of the linear and nonlinear effects. Uh, in fact, if you change the nonlinearity of your equation, then these three factors, they have the same, they, they remain the same, but the last factor changes. So this depends on what is your nonlinearity of your equation. So the last factor is some complicated balance of the dispersion and nonlinear effects. And for the water wave problem and for the rhythm equation, these three factors, they, I1 to I3, they do not change the sign. And this last factor, that is responsible for the tendential type instability. And uh, I... I, I stop here because uh, the other parts uh, require more time than I have. Uh, thank you. Yep. So we have a uh, very good uh, local postness for a very large class of solution, initial data, or we have a uh, long time, like a global postness for a very special small class of initial data. Nothing global in time for a very general class, general class of uh, solution, initial data. This is, uh, there's no result and it is unlikely because uh, Experimentally and also ex empirically, like uh, we believe that uh, many of these uh, water waves uh, they break uh, one way or another, and uh, for, uh, and also wave breaking is uh, actually the fundamental problem, the problem in the water wave uh, community theory. Uh, no, the local wave theory. Now we can have the arbitrary bottom, and uh, for the, the long time. Uh, or global or like a long time theory, finite depth uh, is an issue because uh, for the finite depth case in two dimensions, there is authority waves. And this is the enemy for the global existence because uh, the global existence heavily relies on that uh, waves. If we prepare our initial data very specially, then the, the solution later time will disperse out. That's how we get the low time or global in time. And uh, if we have uh, some salty wave, uh, which does not disperse out or it doesn't get the focus, it stays the same, 
it is it's an enemy for our like a dispersive uh, uh, way of uh, uh, controlling the problem. Local in time? Yeah. Bounded domain. That's uh, uh, so local reposition theory is very, very general. So we can have a bounded domain or like a well, the bounded domain is a problem because then there is a contact angle issue. Because when the free boundary meets uh, the fixed boundary, how we describe here, there is no good theory. But if we have a periodic domain instead, then we can handle. Now, for the small data global existence, uh, this periodic domain is also an issue because, uh, again, this is enemy towards the dispersed waves get dispersed out. Uh, this requires infinite extent the waves can, can, can hide away. This uh, context, there are some pro pro proposed uh, theories how to describe this contact angle and uh, all these existing theories that they suffer from some criticism. So I would say that this is still like a not very well understood. You probably have some experience in this. Yes, uh, and yes, that's also because, uh, be, yes, uh, that also is a problem. And there is some simplified model of this sloping beach but then, like, a, well, this is a, maybe like a too simplified to describe uh, this complicated breaking towards the sloping beach. But there is some uh, pro limited progress for sloping beach. Well, in summary, uh, there are a lot of problems widely open in this uh, area. Yeah. We don't conjecture, yep. Yes, as I said, that the Widom equation can have, there is a proof, we can prove that the Widom equation has small amplitude solid waves. Solitary wave means that there is uh, this single hump it's actually like a KDB, like soliton, which uh, travels with constant speed without changing form. So it does not break and uh, it evolves for all time. So this is an example of non-breaking wave to the volume equation, small amplitude. Uh-huh. Phase transition. Hmm. Well, it's hard to relate it that way because uh, this is a bifurcation problem, and this is a bifurcation diagram. Each point here uh, represents a solution, so that we're comparing like two different solutions. Uh, but if you pick the two points here, so it's not happening in within the same solution, but. Uh, Mm. But uh, actually, this oscillation produces many interesting results uh, in the water wave problem. And uh, certain things uh, change as we uh, pass each and every turning point. Uh, and there is uh, some argument that uh, some notion of stability changes each and every time we pass this. Uh, turning point. So I would just consider this uh, as uh, like a, um, <coughs> yes, so certain properties change. But the uh, gap actually starts not at the turning point, but uh, somewhere between two turning points, yeah. Okay, thank you.